you want to do the intro first, Anita, and then I share my slides and things? Oh, do you want to try that first? or Try that now, shall I? Yes, yes. I'll just... How's that? Yes, it works. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, recording is started, as you can see. Um, I'm going to be the person helping you navigating throughout the next hour. So my name is Anita Dewi. For some of you who don't know me, I'm a lecturer in the School of Information and Communication Studies. Um, and um, actually this seminar series sessions, um, I work with Jane Garner, who is also here today. We take turns um, chairing and because Jane is presenting today. So bad luck, you're stuck with me for the next hour to be your helper, but I'm a nice helper, so be nice with me. I'll be helping with the timing, the Q&A, et cetera. Um, before I start, I'd like to start with an um, acknowledgement of country before we begin the session. So we would like to acknowledge the Rajuri, Nanawal, Gandangara, and Birupai peoples of Australia, who are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which Charles III's campuses are located and pay respect to their elders, both past and present. Um, as I said before to some of you who came earlier, this is quite a popular session. I think I've got quite a number of people saying yes to attend this. Um, the title of the session is quite, yeah, very, not quite, very, very attractive as well, how to get an ARC linkage in 553 easy steps. When I saw the 553, I thought, ooh, 553, but then easy steps. So that's very, you know, encouraging. Um, we have five speakers today, and I'm just going to introduce them very briefly to you, although I'm sure most, if not all of them, don't need any introduction. So first of all, we have Professor Philip Heider. So Philip is a professor and head of the School of Information and Communication Studies. Um, Philip's research is primarily in the field of information and knowledge organization and in a cognate field such as information retrieval and information architecture. So it is focused on the uses and value of metadata in the context of various kinds of retrieval system, including library catalogs, bibliography databases, and scholarly repositories. So Philip has conducted research in and for a range of institutions, including the National Library Board of Singapore, the NLA, the State Library of Victoria, and Australian Government of Office for Learning and Teaching. And then we also have Associate Professor Hamid Jamali. So Hamid is also the Associate Head of School Learning and Teaching at the School of Information and Communication Studies. Hamid researches um, in the broad area of scholarly communication, including research evaluation, journal publishing, and open science. Also studies information behavior and needs of different user groups. His current projects include research on scholarly communication of early career researchers with implications for academic libraries and their research support services, research on um, journal publishing in Australia, and on the use of public library resources. The third speaker is um, Simon Wakeling. Dr. Simon Wakeling is a course director and also senior lecturer in School of Information and Communication Studies. So um, Simon's research focuses on equality of access to information. Um, there are two main streams to his work. So the first focuses on area of scholarly communication and open access, or OA and the principle that research outputs um, should be freely available to anyone who wants to read them. His work on, in, on this um, has included the publication of a book on the theory and practice of OA, and the second strand of his research relates to the role and functions of public libraries, including responses to COVID-19 crisis, value of public library buildings, and the ways in which community needs can be understood and incorporated into public library design processes. Um, we also have Dr. Jane Garner, who also presented last um, month in a, another research project that she's doing. So Jane is um, a senior lecturer at the School of Information and Communication Studies. Jane's research interests relate to the role of libraries and librarians in meeting the information and education needs of their users. The scope of her research extends to the use of educational technologies to improve uh, learning outcomes, 
and the role of information organizations within their communities. Particular research interests include the role of libraries and education in restricted and marginalized communities, the influence of libraries and librarians on education outcomes of users, the use of ICT in education, the use of educational technologies and restricted and remote environments, information organizations as community as assets and the history of prison libraries and reading. So her research into the role of libraries and prisons and the experiences of using them has attracted a high level of interest both in Australia and internationally. And finally, last but not least, we have Dr. Annie Godfrey. So um, Annie is um, a postdoctoral research fellow supporting and funded by the actual um, uh, ARC linkage project. So she started very recently with us 15th of, on the 15th of May, 2023, very fresh, but as I understand it, already very productive as well. Do you want me to say very briefly about myself? Yes, yes, please. I, 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 don't, I'm not actually, I don't think I'm going to be presenting today, but I'm here just to introduce myself as part of the project, I think. Of course. Yeah. Yes, so uh, yes, I'm an architect by training. Um, I have uh, done quite a lot of research in uh, energy management, energy efficiency, and also a lot with um, uh, facility programming, which is the process that you go through when you're um, strategic planning or preparing um, a building design. So hopefully that will become apparent why I'm, uh, you know, why my skills are going to be used on this project. And oh, and I have a, I have a PhD from University of New South Wales. Thank you, Annie, for that. Yeah, welcome. thank you for the introduction and um, uh, welcome again. <laughs> um, without further ado, because even the introduction takes me, what, like eight minutes, seven minutes from the beginning of the session. I would like to uh, hand over the microphone now to Philip, who I understand will start the presentation. Thanks, Anita. Thank you. Yes, so we've got a few minutes left. Um, so only 553 steps to go. Uh, no, um, they're easy steps, as Anita points out. Um, there are a lot of steps. We certainly won't be covering anything like 553. Um, but just to give you a bit of an idea as to how uh, we've come by a, an ARC linkage, which are quite difficult to get. Um, not that many are gotten by this university. So it's good that um, we've got one um, finally, and uh, um, uh, hopefully a lot more to come. These are by no means the only steps towards a linkage, but um, uh, they're some of our steps. So. I think Anita has um, uh, very well introduced everyone. Uh, we're not going to all speak. Um, uh, Annie uh, has only just got here, so he's got a very good excuse for not speaking. Um, Hamid's um, going to answer all the questions. That's how he's getting out of the speaking. Um, Jane's going to interrupt me uh, quite soon. You'll be pleased to know. And then Simon's going to interrupt me again to expand on uh, one or two of the steps, so to speak. So uh, let's get cracking with... Um, a slide. Right. So um, it does go back a while. So we've got a linkage for two years. So we're ki kind of halfway through the journey, you could say, because we kind of started thinking about um, this kind of area of research. Um, I should say, as, you, as you've heard, that none of us really specialise um, in public library design or library design generally or even design. Um, we specialize in all sorts of different things. Um, and um, that's one of the strengths, I think, that we're coming together, bringing lots of different experiences, lots of different expertise to the project. Um, and particularly now that we've got Annie on board, uh, we've got um, all pieces of the jigsaw, I, I would say, in place. Um, she, as she mentioned, really brings the design aspect. It's all about um, co-design this project. So it's really important, obviously, to have a designer on board and probably the ARC people thought that too. So um, before we get to designing public libraries, uh, we start off, um, and I'm not gonna go through the history exactly, but um, uh, probably should start off with the Libraries Research Group. It was established established in um, 2019, so two, um, quite a few years ago now, uh, but um, it was a good way of, of um, 
bringing people together and more importantly bringing um their research together their research interest together and, and um you know everyone who's and probably everyone here is part of a research group or other that's one of the benefits obviously it's not just about um um saying that you're in a group um it's it can be a, a, a way to attract funding and and that is what we've done, as, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, but it's also a way just to share research that other people are doing and, and just explore, you know, intersections and so forth and ways that we might, you know, people, different people in uh, a group can um, come together and collaborate. Um, so uh, we we started off and all, all of us who are involved in the linkage uh, were foundation members, if you like, of, of the research group. And we started exploring different um things that we wanted uh, wanted to do research wise um and a there are a few different strands that emerged um one was about uh, the value of libraries um another or, or part of that um was about specifically public libraries um and uh, a few of us thought that you know maybe we should look at the bigger picture how public libraries are changing uh, in uh, for their communities and so forth. There's a lot, this is not a new topic, uh, but it's one that um, you know several of us were wanting to turn to, coming from different specialties and so forth. And um, uh, concepts like the role of public libraries in in the evolving community, um, and the mission and so forth, uh, the function of public libraries in in modern society. These were concepts that we many of us were interested in. And so we started um, to look at doing some research um, related to this this focus. And quite soon after um, we um, were established, um, uh, some of some of us and, and more than just the people in this linkage project um, uh, got thought it would be a good idea to um, take up the university's invitation to um, uh, to have some uh, internally funded research going into um, the, the pandemic that suddenly um, hit us in uh, 2020. So we were able to um, get a, a, a medium-sized uh, internal grant, and that kicked us off in terms of working together a bit more than we had been before. Um, so quite a few people were involved in that, and we were looking at, in particular, public libraries' uh, response uh, to the COVID pandemic, or at least their initial response, because of course we didn't know it would go on forever. Um, but um, their early responses, you know, how they um, 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 closed or, or stay out, stayed open to the extent that they could virtually and so forth, um, how agile they'd been um, responding to something that was um, that hit uh, hit us very quickly, um, and how they you know stayed uh, in touch with their communities, carried on serving their communities. And, and uh, in often very innovative ways to work around all the restrictions that uh, came into place and so forth. So um, that was, um, uh, well, you'd have thought it would be a very long project because we've only just finishing, only just finishing the last uh, paper, but um, the, the actual research took us about a year or so. Um, we had a uh, mixed methods kind of research going on, big survey, and then some case cut studies. And um, we enjoyed that and we enjoyed it so much that we thought we'd better do some more uh, research into the public library space and the role of public libraries, whether it's in a pandemic or otherwise. And one of the things that um, we were wondering was whether the official version of, of um, what public libraries uh, were doing in the community uh, coincided with um, what was on the ground. So we looked at um, uh, the four of us um, who are particularly interested in this, um, uh, looked at uh, uh, a big sample of mission statements. So the official um, articulations uh, of the roles of public libraries in their communities across across the whole of Australia, in fact. And that was fun. So that was a bit of content analysis, um, uh, mixed methods content analysis. And uh, that um, uh, raised more questions than answers, really. The, the statements did touch on some common themes. Um, and it did move away, as we thought uh, would be the case, and given the literature and so forth, from just information provision uh, and emphasised more, more uh, so um, uh, the, the social impact of libraries, the, uh, the, their role in community well-being and community cohesion, inclusion, etc. 
And one thing that came out was the emphasis, at least in quite a lot of the mission statements around space, the, that it wasn't just about um, information, whether it's digital or not. It was also about um, uh, get, providing community members with a safe, uh, um, welcoming physical space that they enjoyed visiting, apart from when it was COVID. Um, so uh, we um, latched onto that a bit more. And at the same time, uh, we, uh, we were lucky enough um, to be approached by uh, the uh, state, uh, a particular bit of the State Library of, of New South Wales, and in particular, the Public Library Services bit. Um, and uh, the, that team comprised of, uh, comprises of four or five, uh, six consultants who, they don't, they're not in charge of the public libraries across uh, New South Wales, uh, which are uh, uh, ultimately managed by each of the local government authorities, but they do provide some really invaluable advice and advice and support for them, in fact, even some dollars. So they they have some 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 grants to, to hand out for particular things, including things like uh, library renovations and, and, and the like. Um, so uh, we started talking to them about, you know, different um, bits of research that we could done, I should say, uh, we could do. But most importantly, they um, uh, they had a bit of cash for us as well. They uh, they supported research as well as um, actual um, operations of public libraries in in New South Wales. Uh, so they had a little bit of cash here and there, and um, they um, we started talking to them about different you know bits of research that we could do to help them uh, and help the public libraries across the state um, with their operations, improving particular services and so forth. Um, and we came up with, um, and by we, I mean the whole of the library's research group, lots of different people came up with some really good ideas and some good um, small, smaller scale projects, you know, funded to the tune of you know, five, ten thousand dollars something like that. Um, and um, quite a few of those um, were uh, of interest to uh, this team and um, several of them uh, uh, were, were got up and um, um, across the, the the following year or so, uh, we started um, uh, the, the the different members of the research group started to do that, that small scale research for the the public library services team. Um, it wasn't particularly about spaces at the time, um, but um, the initial ones were certainly to do with um, some of those concepts that um, had come up, like inclusion and so forth, um, helping vulnerable groups, um, helping um, uh, people whose first language isn't English and so forth in terms of building particular collections uh, and so forth to help them integrate into the community and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, that was all very successful. Public library people were, services people were pretty happy and we carried on uh, with some more of those smaller scale projects, five, ten thousand dollars and um, the team that became the linkage team um, thought that another good project would be to, um, given COVID, um, to, uh, ask uh, people uh, why they valued visiting their public libraries, why they, they valued their space, whether they, uh, they they valued the spaces because they were welcoming, inclusive and so forth, and do that uh, and, and do that through COVID by asking them why they, you know, what they missed about not being able to um, uh, uh, visit um, their public libraries and, and, and enjoy the spaces that were there usually for them. And so we did that uh, again uh, with the support of um, State Library uh and uh we uh we again we found the same sort of thing and again we found this in the the covid research that people were missed they were really missing the the physical space it wasn't just the information particularly that were they were missing they could get that online often it wasn't particularly the covid information but it was just you know being in that space uh, meeting up with people other people attending events um, maybe maybe the physical collections that um, was a bit different for them and that they felt you know a bit more used to in some cases uh, they you know all, all sorts of other reasons apart from just uh, information and and the things that they could get on the internet it was why they missed uh, and, and why they wanted to have the um, have uh, um, get back into their public libraries so uh, we did quite a 
a, a big um, uh, a bit of research there, surveying uh, um, members of three different communities across the state. We got lots of responses, and and we looked at and we analysed that mostly uh, qualitatively, and came up with a big paper uh, with lots of reasons why you know they valued um, visiting their public libraries that they couldn't get to because of COVID. So. One of the things was uh, around, um, uh, well, lots of things were around, I'll start again, the, the different things uh, that they valued um, were in some cases um, uh, conflicting, they were in some cases quite different, some people wanted the quiet um uh space for study and so forth some people want wanted uh, a space where they could interact socially with people and so forth so it's clear that there was a range of reasons why um they uh they, they were missing various community members and members of different groups were missing the, their, their public libraries and so um we thought um that we might want to do some kind of value valuation evaluation uh of um this the the value of those physical spaces uh, but we've just been um uh, uh um we 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 just at that, that time uh uh found uh, another piece of research from Scandinavia that was um uh already really in that space they were already um evaluating the libraries from a social impact point of view as opposed to you know dollars and so forth um and uh we we thought that maybe if we just do a replication that's not going to be a big enough thing and we're already starting to think about um, um you know a big grant a linkage or something like that so um we uh we thought well maybe we should now narrow the focus a bit so uh maybe a particular aspect and because people were were come uh, visiting libraries for so many different reasons so many competing reasons in some cases uh we thought well well are these different voices being heard how how are these spaces actually being designed um to accommodate all these different interests and and uh concern and and uh, uh um values um that they were expressing um, and this is um, eventually where the uh, co-design uh, of, of public library spaces came up. So we're wondering whether to what extent the community members were actually inputting into the uh, uh, public library space design. Um, and uh, we found out from a, a quick literature search that they weren't very much. Uh, there was a little bit of lip service, but mostly it was just consultation. It wasn't really about... Um, uh uh actually involving the community in the design of the space itself but simply uh, coming up with a design an architect or someone will come up with a design uh and then um uh, they might uh, the community members or some of them might get a bit uh, uh, consulted a bit in, as a, in a focus group or maybe a survey or something rather than them actually being involved in the design process itself so we thought that there was a bit of a gap uh, and uh, another of a gap for um, maybe a, a big project like a linkage, which is all about applied research, uh, helping um, uh, industry improve um, particular processes and services and operations and so forth. So we thought it, it fitted into linkage. We've got the state library uh, on board as a partner for some research. And um, uh, we thought it was a goer, basically. Um, so not something that had done been done very much before. Um, as a, as a, uh, applied to libraries and public libraries in particular, uh, and something of interest to to libraries, public libraries, uh, and so forth. So uh, we put in a ITS uh, uh, in, in intent to uh, submit, um, um, and we that was in late 2021, and we got the uh, green light. Um, we got a mentor, um, Lee Williamson, who, who proved to be quite invaluable. Um, um, and um, we got the state library on board with all the particular, in particular, the public library services part of the state library on board with the concept. So uh, we um, we we thought, let's go for it. Um, and before I um, go through the next steps, um, I'm going to hand over to Jane, who's going to just expand a little bit on what we actually mean by co-design in this particular context. Jane. 
All right, you'll have to release your sharing. Okay, great. I'll just see if I can get mine to share. Okay, so um, what we're looking at here is just a few slides of some ways that other people have gone about co-designing spaces or places within the community. <coughs> this is a, these slides are from um, organisations that do this as a, their business. They go out and they do co-design um, information gathering for you know, part of their job. So these are just some slides taken from some of their um, documentation that explains sort of what some co-design processes might look like. Um, so this is one here they've got, um, you can't really see it, but there's little, um, little uh, cylinders that are clear and everybody in the community who comes along to these um, processes gets a coloured ball and they get to choose where they put their coloured ball. And so you've got um, descriptors at the top here about what they want their neighbourhood to be. So you could do this for a library as well. You could pick out you know, six things that you want to be investigated about. How, how important are these things to the people who are going to use this space? And uh, that's one way they can uh, indicate what's important to them. I need to work out how to move now. Okay, this is another one. Um, this is across the top there. You've got what is your one big idea for making this neighborhood whatever? Um, and then they've got things there that they're investigating. So, making the neighborhood fair, making it beautiful, making it connected. I'm thinking there. So, participants are given a pen and they're able to write their one big idea of what they could do. So, we could translate that into a library scenario and say, What's your one big idea for making this library? Um, you know, welcoming or making this library inclusive or whatever it is that we think might be important to investigate. And then we get the community's ideas about how they could go about doing that. <clears throat> um, another one here, um, what are your ideas about how we can make the new suburb an active and healthy place? Um, again, same idea. So once you've got an idea of what the priorities of your community are for the space you're working with, then you can say, okay, so we've heard from you that it's important that the building's sustainable, it's important to you that it is, you know, lots of natural light, whatever, and then say, okay, what are your ideas about how we could achieve that? And again, just getting some community input into how they want their spaces to be. This one's um, an example of um, mock-ups of what a space might look like and then people get a little sticker and get to put their vote about what's important to them looking at some examples of what a space might look like. Again, similar idea here, this one's saying what three elements are most important to you in Gleedle Street. So this was something that was done uh, in Richmond in Melbourne and again they've got here different um, elements of what the space might be and people get to vote with little stickers about what's important to them. So for a library, we could say uh, what's the most important element to you about your library and it could be something like, you know, connection with outdoor spaces or it could be um, bright and cheery colours, whatever it is that's important to people that you've learnt from previous um, data gathering, then you can get others to vote on that to get um, an idea of how important those things are across your community. Um, same idea here, what are the five most important things to improve this uh, street in this case? And again, we've got examples of things that could be available within that space and people get to vote what's important to them. This is an interesting one in that um, it's outside the area that, well, it's near the area that they are talking about, but so I think this is um, a good reminder that this sort of um, data gathering from community, it's important to do it outside the space that you're actually developing. If like with libraries, if you're only putting these um, opportunities within the library, all you're catching is the opinions of people who are already using the space. If you put it outside the space, then you've got more chance of capturing people that haven't yet used it or might use it in the future if they were able to influence its, its design. Um, this uh, was uh, an example of that. This was at a shopping centre apparently where they were designing um, a new library space 
in Rosanna, again in Melbourne, and they put this at a shopping centre and the local kids who just finished school were rocking past and they got to give their opinion as well. So it's a nice example of um, making sure that there's a whole diversity of different people within the community get a chance to give their input. Um, this was the same project. So yeah, out in the, in the street, in the shopping areas where people are able to they pop their little coloured balls into their, um, to vote for what's important for them and to add some textual information, which was this board here. It's a bad photo, but um, it's a library one, so I included it. So they've said here, what services, programs or spaces would you like to see in the new Rosetta Library? And there's sections on the whiteboard there, programs, services and spaces, and then the community who's just walking past out in the street and doing their shopping gets a chance to have some input into what they would like their library to have. So they're, they're on my slides, but really these are just a, a little quick taster of what a co-design process might look like. And um, we'll be getting some help. Um, Annie's got some great ideas about how that can work. And we will we'll get some help from um, some other people as well about what those processes might look like in our project. And that's um, our way of trying to include the community in the co-design of the spaces we're looking at. That's it from me. I'll now start sharing again. Um, so, the, um, so, uh, so those were the initial steps and that's what we came up with in terms of a, an idea that we wanted to explore uh, the co-design, uh, particularly public library spaces. So, um, as I said, the State Library were on board. They'd been on, um, already um, collaborated with us on uh, quite a few successful projects, including the one I mentioned about um, why my people were missing, uh, not being able to get to their public library and so forth. Um, and just to um, uh, elaborate on the, the partnership that we then uh, forged with them for the linkage application is really important, the key thing obviously is to find the right partner for for a linkage a linkage is a big thing so you need um uh, a partner who's got a bit of cash basically uh but also has got the right you know it's pre preferably that you've got a, a record with preferably that you know quite well the people those four or five people as i mentioned in the public library services team we'd already worked with they were very friendly um we'd already got a bit good rapport with them we're all um and on this um same page in terms of wanting to do the best we could for the public libraries across the state and so forth so um it was a good alignment um particularly given that they were particularly interested in public library that as i said public library spaces and buildings and refurbishments and things like this upgrades because they they, they did have a bit of a um a, a scheme where we had they handed out grants anyway for improvement and they wanted those you know the the best outcomes for for those grants and so forth and they also they they agreed that with us that maybe more co-design elements could be built into some of those or many uh public library um uh renovations and and new buildings and so forth um that um uh were were, were being funded uh to the tune of lots and lots of money hundreds of thousands in some cases millions of dollars um so they didn't have lots of money but they had a, a, enough money so um the rule is for linkage unless it's going to change at the moment but it has been for quite some time that 25 percent of um what you um ask for it's got to um be matched by um uh the the whole of what you ask for has got to be matched either by cash or in kind um, contributions from the partners and 25 percent has got to be cash okay so if you're you're asking for a couple of hundred thousand and, and there's no point asking for 10 20 30 you it won't happen uh you know you've got to ask for big amounts um 100 200 300 some you know sometimes it's half a million but a respectable amount is about 200 so if you, you do the maths um they've got to come up with or someone's got to come up with um, about fifty thousand. Now, they did have that, um, particularly over two years. So we were looking at a two year project. Um, Linkages typically two, three, four, four years. Um, and we 
we, we thought we could do it. We, we were wondering about three, but we thought in the end we could do it in two. Um, so that's uh, uh, 25,000 roughly uh, each year. So uh, they could afford that uh, and they were prepared to also contribute in kind of staff time, mostly in kind of staff time, doesn't have to be, but mostly it is. So we already had a record with them doing a bit um, small, some, some piece of small scale research. Um, we, um, uh, they uh, also had access to uh, um, the, all the different public libraries, they had a big network. They knew all the contacts, knew all the uh, uh, library staff across the state. Uh, or many of them, uh, the the key people. Uh, so that was really important because we needed people. Uh, we needed cases, uh, just as we when we wanted to survey um, users, we needed to work with particular um, public libraries. So we needed some actual public libraries on board, not just the PLS and the state library. Um, but um, they also even had a website on library design as part of their their website are part of their their um, uh, their offerings um, on on useful guides and so forth materials to help um, public libraries manage their um, their buildings and, and manage their services. Um, so um, the, clearly that the, it was um, something of interest to them. Clearly, the outcomes could be used by them to help improve um, other libraries across. Or all the libraries potentially across the state and and beyond and therefore it was a very much a win-win we thought and we still think so um the the next stage or once we got the green light to go ahead by the the ITS was to get find those other the actual cases the actual public libraries who had a build that they wanted to do a refurbishment or reno or maybe a whole new building that they were planning um, and um, find ones that you know we thought fitted what that we could work with and so forth so we did a bit of a call out via the public library services um, teams network and we ended up um, long story short um, with three which we thought were a nice mix of um, cases so there was Albury, uh, two are regional, which we thought was particularly good, um, but a nice um, spread geographically, Yass, uh, and then uh, Fairfield in Sydney, uh, Sydney, uh, Sydney. Uh, and um, in uh, these different cases, um, there are different kinds of um, things going on, different kinds of spaces that they wanted um, to um, uh, to renovate or to, uh, to uh, move to. Um, and um, also, uh, in particular, they were of different scale. So not all um, redesign of uh, redesigns of space, library spaces are big. They don't all involve moving into a brand new building. They could just be a refurbishment. Um, just a, a few bits of uh, of the library might um, be done up again, and so forth. All all are relevant. Um, uh, and so there was a different differences in scale to capture. The, um, the reality of, of different scales of kind of Renault. Um, there was Aubrey, which was um, just a refurbishment of an existing space. Um, uh, uh, there was, or, but could could be a bit more than that. There was uh, Yas Valley, uh, which was a completely new building in a completely new uh, council complex. Uh, and there was um, Fairfield, which was a very straightforward, um, uh, just one biggish room really um uh and um uh they, they just wanted to you know make it better nicer more attractive and so forth for the users so different kinds of uh, things going on different cases and we thought that was a good mix particularly as we'd worked with two of them before in other in the in some of the uh, recent projects that, that were supported by the state library so got some record with them as well as with the state library itself. Um, so we we um, talked to them a lot uh, about um, what they had to do, um, what we had to do with the expectations around, um, you know, um, what how they would help us and so forth, and what what we what our roles would be and everything. Um, and in the end, we we, we you know thought we thought that it would work with them um, and they didn't have the cash but they did have the spaces so that's what mainly they were giving us uh, but um, they 
uh, did have a little bit of cash and it was always good to you know um for them to chip in a little bit as well look good on the application um and they did have some staff time that they could put aside it was a, a bit notional but just like the public library services team they were they were quite happy to um uh, provide some of that for us at least on on the paper uh, and they've been really quite generous so um we you know we were giving them something particularly if we got the the funds um we were doing the co-design for them they were um giving us the cases so that we could actually do the research um and uh, again it was a win-win for each of them so each of them volunteered a partner uh, partner investigators we did we needed that on the application too to show that we were one big team um and um with you know at the end of the day we thought that you know we we had we had all the, the the ducks lined up, so to speak. Um, so we we proceeded with these partners, um, and at the same time as we we're busy writing up the application, we we felt that we should do some more preliminary research on uh, the lack of code design elements, or you know, making sure that there weren't. Uh, this hadn't already been done lots of times before. Researched in, in terms of you know how how to do code design for public library spaces, and to see whether it was actually being done at all. So we did a little um a pilot study so to speak and um simon's going to talk to you a little bit about that and that was very much for the the linkage application we needed to show them so show the 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 arc that you know this was something that was worthy of investigation we had the partners and everything but it's got to be a, an idea that's that's um got some some outcomes that um are of value so simon Thanks. Let me just share my screen. I'm assuming that's the right page. Uh, so yes, as Philip said, this um, pilot study we did had a number of aims. You know, part of it is it's feeding into what Philip's already spoken about, which is building a track record of, of publications for the linkage team, showing that we've worked together, um, produced good outputs, and so on. And, and this we felt was particularly valuable because this this output was directly related to the the topic of that linkage uh, application. And then again, as Philip just said, it was useful in actually then developing the the linkage proposal in being able to justify the need for the research and um, to inform the objective and the methodology that went into the proposal. Um, so a quick shout out for Monique. Uh, Monique Shepherd was the RA for the project. I can't remember, Philip, how we got the funding for that. Maybe you can remind me later or it's not relevant. But anyway, Monique was um, uh, helped us out a lot with this, doing the scheduling of interviews and um, conducting those interviews and helping us with the analysis and, and so on. Um, the, the approach we used was to identify some recent uh, library developments um, based on the Alia Library Design Awards um, for the last few years. Um, and so we selected from those kind of short lists of, um, of public library buildings um, to give us a kind of diverse geographical um, spread, both in terms of, of states and territories and in terms of um, major city versus regional and so on. Um, so we ended up conducting interviews with five librarians and and seven architects. Um, that slight discrepancy is numbers because for one project there were two architects involved, and for another project, uh, another two projects, the same librarian oversaw them um, both. And we asked them about the conception of the project and um, how they were involved in the design process. And, and what we really focused on was the extent to which community consultation was undertaken uh, and the approaches that were used for that consultation. So broadly speaking, we found that libraries and architects together were speaking to community groups. So they would identify, you know, a seniors group or a, a, a young person's group or a, a, a people with disabilities, a local group that could sort of be representative of those members of the community and then would liaise with that groups or leaders of the representatives from that group. Um, they'd also try and consult with individual community members, um, council staff and, and other elected members um, were sort of seen as key stakeholders and, and appeared to have major influence on um, the scope and design of the project. Um, an interesting finding we found was was relating to the extent to which libraries and librarians 
often sort of acted as mediators communicating community needs to designers and to other decision makers and there's you know i think that's something that project our linkage project will explore in quite interesting ways is the extent to which that library mediation serves to um, potentially steer the project in certain directions and maybe dilute the voice of the community um in in the kind of design process um and it was notable as well, and this is you know, a common problem in terms of, of public library research and, and practice around engaging with non-users of the library. As Jane mentioned, there are co-design techniques getting, getting outside the library that make it more likely that you'll be engaging with non-users, typical non-users of the library, but none of the um, projects that we spoke to had kind of explicitly built in a mechanism for identifying and communicating and collaborating with non-users of the library. So the ways they spoke to those people were through sort of formal reference groups. So that's where the kind of representatives of community groups and staff and elected members and so on would meet for kind of relatively formal meetings. Uh, we heard about all sorts of events and displays in the library, I guess similar to the ones Jane was describing, although perhaps not quite as um, uh, as kind of um, methodologically innovative uh, as that. There were some sites which spoke about events outside the library, going to local shopping centres, um, handing out flyers about you know information gathering and, and so on. Uh, and libraries also talked about using surveys uh, of users to get kind of initial impressions Impressions. And in the most part, this happened prior to sort of the pre design stage. Um, there were a couple of examples of, of some sort of iterations of this where architects would present drafts, um, plans, and so on for, for community feedback. But for the most part, we found um, that this consultation happened at a, at a pre design um, stage. So then we asked about and this is kind of really the, the, the crux of it was the kind of influence then that that community engagement had on the, the final um, design. And I think what we found there in most cases, there was some evidence that the pre-design sort of conceptual aesthetic ideas that emerged from some of that community consultation did have some influence on the, the final um, design. Uh, and, you know, got a step further that in a couple of the libraries, some of the consultation, particularly with certain groups in the community who required specific spaces, found their way into um, the final, uh, uh, final designs. Uh, and librarians also noted that there were kind of pragmatic benefits of keeping the community involved just in terms of bringing them along with the project um, it helped sort of build a positive community attitude towards um, the new building there were however some sort of less positive findings relating to community engagement and i've um put the quote in from one of our architects um, which was really quite striking right and this sort of confirmed some other anecdotal evidence we'd heard um, now I'm not sure the extent to which this view is representative of all architects and I certainly wouldn't imagine I, I'm certainly sure that Annie will tell me that or tell us all that that many architects really engage in a positive way with with co-design and community engagement um, but this is an interesting view I think that that essentially you know the, the long and short of this was that this architect felt that this consultation process was kind of window dressing right that it really didn't have too much impact that they you know in another quote they sort of listened to what the community want and then they go away and do what they were planning to do um, anyway um, and I think as a broader point while there were really interesting and innovative forms of of consultation that we found in this study we didn't really find any evidence of true co-design of a truly collaborative iterative process a partnership between communities and libraries and architects to kind of craft together a vision and an, an actual realization of that vision in the in the finished um library so in brief the, the the pilot project really provided good justification for us in saying there's all sorts of good interesting community consultation work happening but it, 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 it's limited and there is more that we can do and it will be helpful, we think, for, for public libraries for us to develop a kind of toolkit to support them doing true co-design for the development of, of community spaces. And that's all from me. 
Thanks, Simon. So almost there. <clears throat> We've only got 551 steps to go now. Um, let's see if I can uh, share the screen. Uh, 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 hang on, everyone, while I share the screen. Everyone see that? So, um, no, that's premature. Um, so I think, um, yeah, we're here. So the final step. So we had a justification. Uh, we had a team, um, some partners, partner with some cash, and the, the case studies. So we are, we are set to go. So we have to do is fill in the application form. Now, the ARC application form is actually not quite so straightforward as all that. They only take a few months to do, um, but um, they do involve some serious work. So you probably realize that, but um, just, just to give you a bit of an idea, sections A to C, uh, C aren't too big. Um, you know, a bit of stats and this and that. Code, although some, some of the issues are it can be some of the things can be an issue like the codes how you're going to code um, the um, the research in terms of the field and so forth but the 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 way you actually have to do lots of work a, a d um that's the actual proposal so that's got to be really good and um uh, it's got to be realistic it's got to be something that's exciting um something that's you know is applied and that's um promises good outcomes good value for money and so forth so that's you you've got to work on a lot you know it's obviously got to be methodologically sound uh, and you've got to get um, everyone on board with that so you only have about 10 pages but you've got to really um, make sure those 10 pages um, work um, that as you can see out of the 138 pages a lot of it is section f and that's the rope so you probably heard about rope um if you've uh, had anything to do with arcs before the research opportunity and performance re evidence and that's basically um where all the investigators um put uh, put in uh, all about their records and it's got to be good you know if the ropes are not there um you're going to hang yourself on the rope probably um so you've got to put in all your pubs you've got to put the the, the relevant ones at the at, at the top you've got to show how you've um all your research um trajectories um coincide um and how brilliant basically you all are very important section e is obviously also very very important because that's where you ask for the money so you've got to ask for the right things typically you ask for in this in social science kind of research either a, po a phd or you ask for a postdoc we wanted a postdoc because we wanted someone with the design experience that's the piece that we were missing that's what we're asking basically at the arc for can you arc give us a design uh, person so that we can go ahead and and um, do this project obviously asked for a little bit more so we asked for a bit of research assistance various things um transcription services this is a very common one of course um equipment for the plasticine and the lego and stuff that we need for the co-design workshops that's the most important part according to simon um and um and then you've got to make sure that they all sign um on the dotted line or the partner organizations so we we can even draft the um their letters for them but they've actually got to sign up at the end of the day all with the partners so we had four partners the three public libraries plus the state library um and um we managed to get it all done by the um, due date which was july and um uh, then we had some rejoinders and then um well and then we had to wait a bit so um just to fill in we don't have much time left so um we won't go through this very much but um this is what we're going to be doing so obviously we don't have any results to share because we only started a few weeks ago officially um but we've we've got three case studies uh that's sydney um fairfield weatherall park um, lavington which is a branch library off um aubrey and uh, yes the big brand new building um so um we are at, uh, bring, um I'm going to add co-design workshops to the design process in each of the cases and then see how they go basically so the question we're asking is um how you know, how best to conduct public li uh, library co-design specifically um so the lessons that we've learned um, through those workshops doing those workshops um and you know whether they worked or not so the before and after interviews with the um the key people 
um, who are hopefully going to benefit from the co-design inputs um, and um, also engaging you know how the users felt about things um, those in, included in the workshops and those not so the whether they the um, the uh, the end the end result the newly designed space is um, better or not uh, and in what way and to what extent did the code design make a difference so the outputs as, as Simon mentioned something for hopefully the um, state library's website um, a guide an online toolkit um, for other public libraries to use to introduce more code design um, workshop for for public librarians across the state and professional and scholarly papers and um, hopefully given all the millions that are spent on public libraries and refurbishments and so forth um, this will be cheap cheap at the price about a quarter of a million so 200 thousand um, from the ARC and about uh, 50 grand um, from the state library and so a few tips have I got time for tips maybe I've got a couple of minutes for tips so um, this this probably comes out from what I've been saying track record you're not going to get a linkage grant without track record not just your own track record but the everyone's track record is on on the team it's got to be really good it's got to um, complement each other so we're bringing we're no, no, no none of the CSU people and now we've got uh, Annie but before then we, we didn't know about design but we did know about other things uh, some were on the qual side some on the quant side and that worked because this is mixed methods um, so we had some backgrounds that were relevant in various respects um, then uh, if you can build a, t a record as a team that's much better that, that shows that you can work together and we had those projects um, that we we've been doing recently and got outputs from them so we did have that and we also had a record with the partners that we had on on, on the application as well most of them so that was really handy uh, and pretty I'm sure it would have put us in good stead. We had the right partner for the project. Um, their their uh, goals were aligned with our goals in terms of results, um, practical results for public libraries into the future. And they had some cash. That's critical, obviously, um, because you need that for the linkage. Um, we um, we got the right people on side, the people who uh, controlled the budget, the public library services manager. Um, we um, had lots of talks with them about um, making sure that you know it was we're all on the same page about how long it's going to take, what the uh, each other's responsibilities were, etc. Um, we made sure it was you know the outcomes um, were going to be um, potentially um, useful and practical and something that their clients, the, the public libraries, um, would actually appreciate. That's key. Um, we brought them in as partner investigators. We're the chief investigators. They're the partner investigators. Um, we kept them in the loop. We, we ended up writing most of the application, but we always consulted them about the details. Um, and we put in contingency plans as, as best we could. So if one of the public libraries had dropped out, we, had, we were having to think about a plan B and so forth. Luckily, that didn't happen, but it could easily have happened. Um, and of course, there's only a 30 odd percent chance of actually getting the linkage. So what happens if you don't? As it happens, the state library was going to um, contribute that what they said they were going to contribute the 50 grand anyway so that was really handy we could have done something smaller scale but um still worthwhile so we did have a, a plan b which uh luckily we didn't have to use uh deliver on the project outcomes we haven't done we haven't got to that yet um but that's obviously uh the next um few hundred steps and is going to be critical because if you want another linkage you have to do um yeah you have to actually uh, do do the project and do your first linkage get some good outcomes and that shows you know it's a it's a circular thing that shows that you're you know you can do you know you're, you're well positioned to do more linkages and so forth so it's our first linkage together and certainly we'll be striving with the assistance of Andy who, uh, who's going to make all the difference uh, on the design front um, we're, we're going to be striving for all the things that we've um, promised to do and uh, hopefully deliver and in maybe a, a year's time or so uh, we can share some of those um, findings uh, and outcomes with you um, and <clears throat> those are the <clears throat> references from um, some of the projects that uh, I mentioned that we've been doing together thank you sorry it's gone on as yeah. usual <laughs> thank you Philip do you mind um, stop sharing I guess so we can see everyone very good timing um, one minute to one.
Philip, um, I'm sure all of us are very keen to hear updates and outcomes of the project down the track. Um, and I personally definitely learned a lot from the session today, as I'm sure everyone else here did too. Okay, well, I guess that's it. Um, just a reminder, there will be another session, of course, next month. So we are all looking forward, Jane and I, I suppose, are very much looking forward to see you all again and maybe more people uh, next month on a Wednesday, 12 to 1 p.m. AST. Should let you go now. Let's go back to our own daily routines work. See you. Take care.